step behind the camera and welcome to the iPhotography podcast. So thank you very much for joining us on this next episode of the iPhotography podcast. My name is Steve and I'm here as a regular, as is our guest today. You're here pretty often. This is Nick. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I a guest? I, 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 just, like, <laughs> I, I think... pop up every now and then, don't I? Yeah. Well, that's it. It's, it's, it's not you and me every week, unfortunately, as well. But yeah, it's nice having a bit yeah. of variation as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this is basically like a, the first part of a mini series that we've decided to do, uh, isn't it, Nick? Uh, yeah. Been- yeah for a while. well we uh, originally we planned to try and do it in one podcast and then we thought oh my god you know we can't fit all this in, in one go <laughs> it's so gonna be the world's longest podcast potentially yeah, yeah yeah we don't want that do we uh so we decided to because we're looking at the history of photography uh now i used to teach history of art and design and obviously i taught photography as well so it was part of my remit and I'm aware that a lot of um, a lot of my students didn't really like the history bit. It was like, oh, <laughs> this is really boring. Do we have to do this? But I was always really, in- when I studied, I was always really into the history of it. So for me, it's yeah. quite interesting. Um, but there's an awful lot, awful oh. lot to go over. So well, we decided to it. split it into three sections. And the first mm-hmm. section's kind of on the development of the, you know, the sort of technical side of photography, how photography works, but without going into details of you know physics and chemistry and all that because then well then that's I get, it then i'd get bored as well because well well that's i mean as <laughs> as, as, inf- as informative and as interesting as it yeah. can be for some people not everybody want to go in into into such in-depth yeah. kind of understanding of photography yeah. maybe just knowing about the milestones the background yeah. of it as well it just informs you a little yeah. bit more about the, yeah. the this wonderful hobby but so like as, as nick rightly said we're going to split this down this is like a mini series this is uh, episode one of three um today's show is about the history of photography but looking at camera technology the technologies of how cameras and you know what we use to kind of capture light how that's changed and we'll be going back hundreds of years in our <laughs> virtual time machine today on thousands, Zoom. Thousands, thousands of years oh my word you must have notes <laughs> that are different to mine but we've basically been researching separately ourselves to kind of create notes and create ourselves a, a virtual timeline of how technology has changed for photography over the years um in episode two we'll be looking at the history of photography but on a more social aspect in respects to how photography had changed along with society uh civilization um looking at generations and how they took on to photography um that's about right isn't it nick in, in episode yeah. two yeah it's kind of movements in photography as well and how yeah. the developing kind of technology so it's done on the same kind of timeline mm-hmm. but more with an emphasis on what photography was for and how it was used like you say what you know different types of photography and how it influenced our culture really and then in the third one, we're going to look at um, individual actual, you know, photographers, mm-hmm. which obviously could be more of a visual thing. So it might be better if that was if people could ha- have got access to watching it on YouTube, probably a better way of doing it. But obviously yes. we'll try and try and make it sort of relevant to people who are list- just listening to it as well. Indeed. Very good. And if you can hear, it's, poor Nick is, is yeah. suffering with a cold of you here as well. He's uh, It's not COVID related, is it? <laughs> no, th- no. Um, you'll have to suffer me sniffing and snorting all the way through it. And <laughs> I'll do, I'll do my best not on editing. having to blow my nose or anything, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that well, is why I keep on sniffing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start off on our, in our virtual time machine then as we begin, begin the history of photography. Um, and yeah, my, my notes really take us back to um, the first incantation of photography referred to as the camera obscura. Now, this is for me is going back to the 1500s. But have you got notes that go back previous? Well, I, I think it was 1500s when it actually, I think Da Vinci described it and, and it was started to be used by artists, didn't it? But mm. apparently it, was, it had already been described uh, in theory by a uh, Chinese philosopher called Mao Tzu, yeah. who actually described what would be known as a pinhole camera and how an image kind of could be formed through that. And the Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, had also seen that you could see images of a solar eclipse uh, through the uh, the canopy of a, of a tree. Mm-hmm. So it acted like so if you look and apparently you can do that I, I, I found a picture of it i'll get it through to you i found a picture of it somewhere uh 
which has got it shows you how you can see the eclipse reflected in lots and lots and lots of images on the ground through uh, through the leaves of a tree, oh, cool. which is how he first described it. And basically, it's the same idea. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I, I did have a, a similar note that the oldest recorded, you know, the, the oldest record of the snow principle was from the, I should say, the by a ha I had Han Chinese. I don't know if that's a variation of, of descendancy, but yeah, of, of Motsi or oh, is it Motsu, Motsi? Um, I think the trouble is, I think there's lots of different ways of pronouncing yeah, it. Yeah, so. that's it. I think it was back, back to like 400 <laughs> BC. So what's that? Yeah. We're talking about nearly yeah, yeah. two and a half thousand years yeah. ago uh, um, when, when that kind of came in. But then in terms of the more established or at least, you know, establishing some form of photographic equipment, yeah. let's say the camera yeah. obscura became the the next stage but that wasn't really for like another you know what is effectively like 2000 years on from from what Motsi first described and so that's into the 1500s so yeah, yeah, the yeah. camera obscura uh latin uh for the word dark room i believe that is the the translation yeah, apparently yeah yeah and then obviously much later on the obscura bit got dropped and just became you know what we know as a camera now but basically it's still the same thing isn't it yeah Box. A dark box uh, that light gets into through a hole or a lens or, or whatever. I mean, lenses came later, mm -hmm. but uh, people, you know, you can still make a pinhole camera yourself, can't you? And That's it. I, I think I got a kit like for that. one, like maybe many, many Christmases yeah. ago. And effectively, it was just a very small wooden box. And there was a hole drilled through it and a piece of light sensitive paper that yeah. went on yeah. the on the wall, on the kind of plane opposite. And that's all it was, that light was effectively passing through this hole there's no lens there's no glass yeah. through that hole but then it basically can projects an image um inverted on the opposite side uh, and i've seen people do that i actually saw a project once someone doing it in, in paris and they yeah. blacked out an entire room so it was almost like a big hotel room oh, cool. and they put bin bags all over the wall light sealed the entire thing and literally got a pin and then wow. poked it into the uh to the the bin bags yeah. so it's got the tiniest of holes and the projection they got on the other side was amazing and it was like of the whole city outside but like flipped on the wall <laughs> so it, you, it shows you, right. you do it without literally any you know modern technology to be able to kind of record an image and, and that's yeah. how it started um what's that kind of 500 plus years ago really isn't it yeah and i think uh, you were saying about you know having a, a small pinhole camera but i think you can actually just put a uh, I think you've put a bit of black card in front of uh, a lens on a di digital camera and do pretty much the same. Yeah, actually, that would work, wouldn't it? Because I'm pretty sure I, I remember when I, you know, it was before digital cameras, but I remember you could get like little black uh, discs, I think metal discs that you could mm. fit on the front of your camera and convert it into a pinhole camera, obviously using 35 mil film, but I okay. can't see why you couldn't do the same thing using a digital camera as well. It must be a massively long exposure time, like your what yeah. equivalent shutter yeah, yeah. speed is, then you know, to the amount of time you needed to let light in would be, yeah. Yeah. could be days really um well, yeah early exposures did uh, you know uh, <laughs> they went on forever didn't they so. yeah i mean and this is maybe something we'll touch on at another point maybe in yeah. another show yeah. um where we talked about the when like the victorians were having portraits taken that their exposure times again because of the technology was a lot longer so people had to sit still for maybe like 30 40 seconds and you try and think about staying still for that length yeah, of time exactly. not even blinking yeah, it's yeah. so hard so as technology progressed um the next milestone i had had on our journey was basically about 300 years later um, with a gentleman, a French gentleman called Louis de Guerre. Um, yes. This is in 1839, the de Guerre wow. type. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's um, de Guerre types. Let me think. Um, I'm just checking my notes here. Uh, the first actual light sensitive uh, image before Daguerre was produced by, um, I think it was Thomas Wedgwood, who's right. the son of Josiah, Josiah, Josiah Wedgwood. I'm never <laughs> sure how to pronounce it, but the the famous Wedgwood, pottery Wedgwood. I was just going to say, yeah, they related. Yeah, yeah. So his son captured the first images. Uh, it was on on leather, uh, uh -huh. and they were basically like photograms. So it was it was silver nitrate, I think, salted leather. And he managed to make um, shadow images on pieces of leather that had been light sensitized. So the first ones um, were produced. He was experimenting uh, in the 1790s, believe it or not. 
Oh, really? So the first kind of Im- and then later on, there was this guy who I can never pronounce. I think it's Nisa for Niepsi. Yes, I, I just named <laughs> it. it. I, I, Isidore, uh, I would have said like Ni- it's like Nietzsche, uh, like the, the, yeah. the poet, but uh, Ni- it's Nietzsche. It's got one. a P in the middle. But yeah, yeah. I think I, the note I had was. Um, that the first photographic camera developed for commercial manufacture was a daguerreotype camera built by Alphon- yeah. Alphonse Giroux in 1839. Okay. So you know the French right. with a name like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Giroux signed a contract with Daguerre and Nishi uh, to produce yeah. cameras in France, uh, and each yeah. costing around about 400 francs at the time, right, okay. which I'd love to yeah. know what the equivalent yeah. is these days, because I imagine 400 francs back then was a still lot a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, yeah. that was the, the first kind of incantation of something an being camera. an actual camera in your hand, yeah. in a sense. Yeah, Not yeah. obviously the cameras like we hold these yeah. days, but certainly something a little bit more yeah. uh, substantial and dedicated in that way, yeah. really. But yeah. have, you, have you ever seen like the, the kind of images that produce from a daguerreotype? Yes, well, they're like um, they're, they're, they're like little mirrors, aren't they? And they're quite dark and quite mm. difficult to see. Almost like a tin um, type finish, isn't yes. it? Yeah, well, because apparently tin types were kind of uh, another version of the daguerreotype image, weren't they? Mm. But they were daguerreotypes are direct positives, from what I can remember. So when he made a daguerreotype, it was a it, it was a positive image on uh, I think it was some kind of silver plated base uh that was developed using uh mercury vapor i think something like oh, that wow. um so it's quite poisonous i was gonna say it's quite dangerous yeah. <laughs> quite a dangerous method <laughs> and a little bit involved in the sort of thing that um they set up uh special degree um studios uh quite often on the roofs of buildings so they needed obviously needed a lot of light where yes. you go and sit for a long time with your head in a clamp <laughs> <laughs> to stop you from moving uh, sounds so would, appealing <laughs> and they would process and produce uh the daguerreotypes for you so it was only kind of accessible to to the wealthy really um yeah but but this guy nisifor his 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 first experiments had also been with producing paper negatives which weren't particularly successful commercially, but apparently that's what led to the later invention by uh, Fox Talbot. Although Nisifor Nif- Nietzsche had worked with Louis Daguerre on the daguerreotype as well. So there were two alternative methods both being developed at the same time yeah. in, in the early, sort of, uh, early 19th century, yes. uh, which led to what then became you know modern photography but it was two very different types of photography yeah well, i was going to say you you lead on quite nicely because you, it is literally almost the year later um english i think english gentleman henry fox yeah. talbot brings in the process of the color type uh, yeah. in 1840 so this is when we start talking about emulsion plates or you know wet plates as some people call them and they were a little bit uh, cheaper than the daguerreotypes, and apparently they, they only really needed an exposure time. They cut that right down to around about two or three seconds this time. So yeah. the, the whole process of taking or capturing a photograph in the space of a year, the technology has changed already. And we're talking about 1840, we're talking about 180 years ago. It, it's yeah. incredible even yeah, over yeah. You know, that one year, how much the process then had changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they were, they were sort of competing processes from what I know is that uh, the the daguerreotypes were very popular because they produced very, um, very detailed images. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Fox Talbot's color types were quite soft because, first of all, it was a paper negative, and then that paper negative had to be contact printed onto another paper, which I think to start with they were they were made with albumin. Uh, they were coated with egg white, basically. Oh wow! And apparently, it took. Uh, Britain, just the UK itself, it became so popular that we used up to half a million eggs a year making <laughs> making these uh, calotype prints. No <laughs> way. I know. That, that was one of those kind of weird but fascinating facts. I thought, half a million eggs a year to create, create the it. first photos commercially. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, there were disadvantages and advantages. You could obviously yeah. you could you could um, produce more of them. I think you could make bigger images with the color type because mm-hmm. uh, 
the uh, daguerreotypes were quite small plates. Uh, they weren't. It wasn't particularly portable. I don't think either process was particularly portable. Yeah. Uh, so you had to go to a studio. But there were people who went around and started taking photographs of landscapes and things like that. And we'll get mm. into that in our second uh, second episode. Yeah. Uh, it, it it started to sort of it, it spurred on an interest in photography through those two different processes, uh, but shortly after that only you know things happen very rapidly as they seem to have done in the world of photography the advances have been very quick yes you know once it happened to start with suddenly so many innovations came along and things came in and out of fashion and went in and out very quickly so by the end of that decade uh there was a, a new invention which was the the wet plate on glass uh which was Again, a British invention, Frederick Scott Archer, who invented the collodion wet plate, where you can make a large negative on glass. Yeah. And you'd have the detail that you could get with a daguerreotype, but you could also uh, print it onto paper. So you could get paper prints and you could make as many prints as you want. Yeah, so, I, I had written down that they had two yeah. types of these wet plates. Um, they had the tin type um, and the amber type. Um, so the amber type used a, a glass plate instead of like a copper, like like, uh, and yeah. daguerreotypes used tin. So there's there's a little bit of change in the in the materials that were used uh, in that sense. I mean that they said those types of plates were a little bit more sensitive to light, so they developed a lot quicker, which obviously saves time in the whole process. Like you said, the technology is even you know this this many years ago was evolving rapidly, and as and it still yeah. does. You know, as yeah. like dry plates come in, maybe another. 20 years later, 30 years later. Yeah, well, I think tintypes and ambrotypes became popular in America because they were much cheaper than, than the wet plate process and easier for people to do. But they still, they used the same principle as mm. a wet plate um, in that it created a negative image, but you could see it because they backed it with a reflective material. So you look back through the material. So you were basically seeing a negative image yeah. reflected onto something else. So it became a positive, even though it was actually a negative. And yeah. It was a cheaper way of producing it. But you could only do one at a time. That they weren't reproducible like um, like collodion. But then collodion was a more complex process. Yeah. Uh, and it was dangerous as well because it was quite explosive, apparently. A oh really? People, yeah, yeah. A lot of people uh, blew themselves up and set fire to their studios. <laughs> well, you see, it. you see, kind of maybe also <laughs> when it comes to like the technology yeah. of, of camera yeah. flashes. Year later, that the yeah. um, people, yeah. I, th I don't know if it's like silver nitrate or something like that. They they basically kind of blow yeah. up inside yeah. this little um, this little unit to create that flash. Um, yeah. But yeah, people did things in a very what you could say in hindsight, very silly ways necessarily, but you didn't necessarily know at the time. But um, but yeah, alongside those advances in the technologies of the the printing and the recording, um, this was also around about the time with color types that that bellows started to come in on cameras as well. So you could alter the focus, um, whereas previously you always had like a fixed focal plane. But now you could adjust the focus um, on people or landscapes, whatever it is yeah, you were photographing yeah, yeah. as well. So that's yeah. like another piece of technology that came in around this kind of mid 1800s uh, period. Because after that, um, I think we're starting to kind of lean into to the times of like gelatin and dry plates. I had that was coming in around about 1870. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Collodion made photography accessible to more people it made it uh accessible to amateur photographers because you could actually set up your own uh studio quite easily in a dark room with collodion it, it wasn't mm. the easiest process to do but it led to a lot of amateur photography and it led to it was much cheaper um it led to the, the there's this craze the carte de visite mm. craze where they they would have it would be one large plate uh, but they divide it up in the camera and take a number of photos on the camera and then contact print that. And you could get loads and loads and loads of them. So people use them to drop off. And uh, it, it was really the, 
almost like the start, not not of the selfie because people didn't take it themselves, <laughs> but it was the start of somebody being able to take an image of themselves and then give it to people. Uh, so it was the start of what I would say like celebrity photography as well, because celebrities at the end of the 19th century started having these images made and distributed. So it helped them get more popular. So it, it was the beginning of, I would say, celebrity culture as well. There, which yeah, I think is quite it influences content yeah. creation. It yeah. ha it's been happening so, yeah. for a lot longer than maybe we think. Um, but yeah, but again, so it was it was quickly superseded by dry plates because yeah. the thing with collodion was it had to be the plates had to be made sensitized and photographed and developed while they were still damp it, if it dried out it didn't work so they were they, they would rapidly found a replacement which was um gelatin albumin had been used to start with but it wasn't stable and it was quite difficult to cope but apparently they discovered a way of making gelatin uh, plates that, that could then be sold commercially you, you could package them coat them package them sell them commercially and that led again to a photography being taken up by a lot more people as amateurs as well and yeah. made everything much easier quicker you know more compact and eventually led to the development of uh the you know the first kodak compact cameras where yeah you had a they they, they discovered a way of creating these negatives using gelatin uh, on paper to start with. So it was a, a roll of paper that was inside the camera and you could take apparently a hundred photos yourself uh, mm -hmm. and then send it back to Kodak. They'd process it, print the little images, which are just little round images apparently, send them yeah. back to you with a new roll of paper in the camera, uh, which then they found they could do on cellulose as well. So that was when they first developed uh, film. So the yeah. first films came out around about that time at the beginning. I've got some dates here, I think, where... where yeah, I had around about, about 1888, this Kodak roll film um, start to come yeah. out, obviously, Kodak, um, yeah. founded by George that Eastman. Was yeah. um, but is that, is that about the right dates that you had? Yeah. 1888 was yeah. when he brought out the first roll film. Uh, well, it was the first roll paper. And then a year later, I think they replaced it with a roll film. Yeah. Uh, and that that pretty much became the standard for photography for the rest of the 20th century. It, it was. And obviously, you know, Kodak itself dominated many, many years, especially of the commercial market over the, the 1900s, because what, what they came out with was a very simple, well, the box camera, really. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of people will have heard of the phrase like box brownie, etc. But it was just a fixed focus lens. And there was only one shutter speed in there as well. So you were very, very limited. Yeah. Um, but the fact that they were able to commercialize it so well is they said it lowered the price down and it made and it allowed photography to become more widespread because as we may talk about like in movements in our in our next show on this uh, topic is that photography previously had just been for the rich you know and now yeah. this yeah. this george eastman was able to bring it out to uh, to a wider market um and the fact is you say that you know that the camera had like a hundred you know it was loaded preloaded with like a hundred shots you know it, it was taking people what are we talking about maybe about 30 years previous people could only produce one image at a time and sometimes yeah. those exposures were like minutes long you know 30 years down the line you've got a camera that i think would be kind of quite recognizable to a lot of people these days yeah. able to take 100 shots and it's it's incredible and you know we shouldn't be surprised really that photography jumps so quickly ahead now because of you know the yeah, yeah, development yeah. of civilization etc as well but it still was moving at a rapid pace um even back then to get to where we are yeah i've got uh, some interesting details on the first on the that first kodak camera apparently it was about it measured just six uh, six by three inches so it was just a little box it wow really small. that's tiny really small <laughs> it's, well it's it, not actually so it's not yeah. far off maybe the size of yeah. what modern cameras are now exactly. or phones so yeah there's no viewfinder so you just have to point it and hope for the best so <laughs> did it did have any kind of... been a bit tricky <laughs> what was no the focal viewfinder. length did it did it say fixed like... focus f9 f9 lens which oh covered gosh. subjects so yeah. from you couldn't get any closer than eight feet but it would <laughs> take sharp <laughs> photos for anything from eight foot to infinity that's crazy so, landscape photographers would so, love that <laughs> oh yeah absolutely but eight 
feet away, feet so away from a no portrait. portrait. No, <laughs> full, full length shots, maybe. Yeah, but full length. Yeah, no, nothing and the shutter kind of... speed, <laughs> fixed shutter speed, one twenty fifth of a second. Okay, yeah, so you could so do it handheld, depending it, on the weight. You weights. could take handheld photos if you were careful. So, uh, well, had tripods even? I, they, they would have been established already, wouldn't yeah. they? Given the size and weight in some of the older cameras, so I imagine they they were already existing. But I believe also around about that time, maybe a couple of years later, slightly separate to uh, the actual camera technology somewhat, but the standardization of f-stops actually came in at the turn of the century at about 1900. Ah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I don't have much information about it, but I, I know around about that kind of year is, is when yeah. um, it was basically established, you know, what, what f-stops relate to what size apertures, obviously they're all measured, um, yeah. but effectively, uh, you know, that worked out those numbers, et cetera, as well. And that's what yeah. we, we still use now 120 odd years later. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird, really, isn't it? Because sometimes you kind of think, do we actually need to be using a lot of these terms and technologies because everything's so different now with digital yeah. imaging? Uh, is it, you know, is it even photography now? Is it, you know... It's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? It's, it's, it's probably a different debate, isn't it, that we're getting yeah. into, but I know yeah, what you yeah, mean. because philosophical. But, you could um, just go, yeah. turn your dial one way, it gets brighter, yeah. and you stop when it's bright enough, and turn the other yeah. way, and it goes yeah, darker, yeah. and stop when you're dark enough. Do we need the numbers, like, yeah. in, the, in the old form? But yeah. I don't know. I think there's a lot of purists probably still out there that would rebel against such a change of yeah. eliminating yeah, f-stops yeah. or the importance of them. Yeah, I think we're so used to using them. It, 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 it's like you can't imagine what, what you would do without them but basically mm. when if you think about what you're doing with a with a digital camera a lot of the time is just um you're getting a lot of information and cameras are getting better and better at capturing that information so it, it does kind of mm. make a lot of those things obsolete really we yeah. still use them as a means of describing describing what we're doing but it, it's probably not as relevant in many ways because like like you say with um iso i mean that related to film and sensitivity uh, yeah so you know which which is all changed now well that's um, it you get get to the point that sensors now become are becoming so sensitive and this yeah. is why we're seeing more and more f-stops created but like half yeah. stops and third stops that yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. get to a point where they'll literally be you could shoot it eight point uh, f8 and then f8.1 point two point three and as yeah. you say it starts to become redundant it makes a mockery of the original yeah. standardization that that there is yeah. so many kind of minute changes available yeah. um yeah. that i you know i as much as i see them around in the future um I, I certainly see the technology changing that so much ai will come into to the realm yeah. that the camera will will set the exposure so well in time that yeah, you know, you you probably wouldn't have to have as much manual controls and it'll be sold on the basis that it makes photography a lot easier, um, which, you know, it, it's great for a lot of people, um, but I know a lot of people probably won't like that. They like the idea of control, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think standardization, uh, it, it was very necessary because there were so many different people competing, weren't there? Mm. And uh, at some point you kind of think... Uh, certain things needed to be fixed and, and and with cameras it was the same thing certain things on cameras became standard yeah. because they were so successful so other people copied them and adopted them yeah uh, and stuff had to be interchangeable as well to some extent so different people's films like if you produced a film you wouldn't want your film to not work in somebody else's camera would you that's so you've got the standardization of roll film and 35 mil which i was going to bring up because uh that that came out in here we go 1889 oh, where right. george eastman cut so it it, it was yeah so that the first roll film was created obviously for that um, Kodak camera that we talked about before. Mm. Um, and then Thomas Edison, because he was looking at um, making moving pictures, he that format was too big. So he cut it down the middle. So he took um, Kodak's film, cut it down the middle and added perforations on each side so it could be run through a movie camera. And that's what created 35 mil film that, that, that we use now. Yeah, that's so, really interesting that, yeah, not many people know how involved maybe Edison was to yeah. photography and what I suppose, what is the, you know, the, the birth yeah. of cinematography as well. Because I, I had yeah. like 35 mil cameras becoming 
um, marketable, coming more prevalent um, a couple of years later, around about 1913, just pre-war, uh, pre-war area, uh, era. Um, I think it's maybe actually maybe between like 1905 to 1913, something like that. But there was a number of manufacturers. It wasn't just um, Kodak yeah. that were coming in to do it as well. This is when like uh, the Japanese camera industry started to take off. And that's maybe a yeah. few more years after that. Well, in, in, in terms of cameras, obviously, um, there were a lot of different people making cameras. And Kodak's was the first kind of popular commercially available. And then the, there was the Box Brownie as well that came out, wasn't there? And I've got mm-hmm. um, the first proper 35 mil camera was uh, the leica that came out in 1925 yeah. and that uh was the, introduced in 25 and it was a prototype using the 35 mil film which people hadn't used before people had been using the the kodak format of film because the the 35 mil had been used uh independently not for still photography but for yeah. photography uh, but also in the, in the 20s, you got the first um, proper twin lens reflex cameras came out. The, the Rolleiflex, I think, was introduced in, uh, where was it, around about 1928. Uh, so then you had the two kind of standards that we used. Mm-hmm. And so you had uh, you know, roll film cameras and 35 mil cameras, and they continued to be used well, up until, you know, when I, I was studying photography in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It was still the two standard types of camera that you'd use. You'd use a medium format camera. Obviously, by then, there were a lot of different types of medium format cameras. So mm-hmm. you had, uh, we, we used Mamiya's in, in, in college, yeah. uh, which were single lens reflexes rather than twin lens reflexes. But I also had, I, I bought, I think my first medium format camera that I bought was a very cheap, I think it was either Russian or Chinese twin lens <laughs> reflex, a seagull or something, which I quite liked because it had um, it, it gave you images that had quite a nice feel to it because the lenses weren't great. So there's a little bit yeah. of distortion in the lenses. So you got a, a bit of a vintage feel to the photos that you took from them. That's quite popular. Like even these days, um, like lomography and things like that, yes. those, those types yeah. of sub genres, maybe of photography nowadays, yeah. but they, they, they go back yeah. to basically, you know, what, what people were still bringing out was good technology um, yeah. then. Because yeah, yeah. as you say, it, it's so weird that for maybe that period we discussed back in the 19th century with, with Fox Talbot and Daguerre, et cetera, that there were, there were changes in the materials that they were using, sure. A, to shoot with and to, to expose on. But then once 35 mil came out around about, you know, pre-war, pre-World War, War World War One, yeah. it stayed with us up until um, digital came in. Um, so it, it's a huge lifespan that nobody really kind of changed the, uh, or looked necessarily to change yeah. the materials yeah, yeah. as to what we actually shot on. But what they started to do was change the technology of the camera bodies, look at lenses and glasses elements and, you know, yeah. elements within that as well. But they kept the actual, uh, you know, consistency of working on 35 mil pretty much the same for, I suppose, around about kind of 50 years after it was invented. Yeah. I mean, the first cameras, obviously, they they were, you had to, they were waist level, so you had to look down to, yeah. to, to, to see your image, and it was reversed as well, wasn't it? So it's a bit weird. It's very, uh, have you ever used one? I yes. imagine you've, you've used yeah, many. Yeah, 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 because I used to have a Hasselblad, uh, which I loved, um, but it was sadly stolen when I got broken into, and I've never replaced it because it's oh. not cheap. No. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Hasselblad, it's just such a lovely thing to hold. It's such a beautiful piece of technology you know and it, yeah. you, you know you feel like you're holding a bit of history in your hands as well when you use one well that's it so, i mean they produce new ones obviously now digital ones but the yeah, film ones yeah, you'd yeah. imagine it's like a car you know it's had previous yeah. owners you know what what are people yeah. taking yeah, with this yeah. and i i love like the little rolling handles at the side as well yeah. it's it does remind you of uh, you know a, a period even you know remember when you i yeah. remember when you used to not as if you would have necessarily done it but in the old movies when they start cars and planes with the uh, like with the rotor on the front yes. you know they yeah, put the yeah. key in. It's almost like how you, they take a oh, picture, yeah. they use that swinging arm yeah. on the side of it as well to kind yeah. of roll on the exposure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that there is something quite nostalgic about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They just feel nice. Yeah. Um, so 
the, the other thing, other important developments were obviously, so you had that way of using a camera. I mean, now we're all used to, you know, lifting a camera up and, and looking through a viewfinder. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, those, the first um, pentaprism apparently was developed in 1936. Yes. Uh, yeah. By, in Russia originally. Uh -huh. So it was developed in Russia. Uh, and then the first camera that was actually uh, produced and available was uh, a, um, I think it was an Italian camera, uh, and Zeiss as well. So it's it's a bit tricky. They were all competing at the same time, um, yeah. working on the same ideas. So I know Zeiss brought out their first um, uh, Pentaprism camera, uh, which one? No, that was called the because. Uh, it gets it gets quite interesting because some of these cameras I actually remember uh, <laughs> from my dad and my grandparents because they were both photographers as well. So obviously they I had hand me down. I had a, 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 a some German old German camera which I think was the first one that I was given when I was a kid, like an Agfa also, or something. Yeah, no, it wasn't Agfa. I think it was a, a what are they called? I uh, can't remember off hand now, but uh, it's here somewhere on my timeline. The trouble is there were so many different ones that came out. and But I did have uh, a, a very early Nikon camera, and apparently Nikon mm -hmm. only came out in 1959. It did, yeah. I yeah. didn't realise they were so late. I always I, imagined they'd been around a lot longer than that. No, well, it was, it was, they, they kind of, I'll say like merged. They were like, you know, other companies. So like they, they were, I think they were around and established, not necessarily as a camera company. They were doing yeah. some elements of the technology before they started right. to kind of change. Um, I had a note that, um, uh, I think it was like into the 1950s. So it jumped a little bit further ahead. A company yeah. called Ashai, which later became Pentax. That's Pentax, yeah. Yeah, they introduced the Ashai yeah. Flex uh, and Nikon right. brought out, I'd say, the Nikon F and these yeah. were like kind of SLR type cameras. Yeah, um, yeah. But the Nikon F allowed you effectively to change lenses. Yeah. So what yeah, we know yeah. now is, you know, it's like a DSLR, but, you know, the, the yeah, ability yeah. to switch that. But in the yeah. middle of all that, uh, maybe kind of, like late forties period, um, Polaroid um, emerged their head from the ground with the Polaroid model seven, uh, model ninety five, um, and this was effectively like the first instant camera. Um, yeah produced by a gentleman called Edwin Land. So a lot of people called it the Land camera uh, yeah. after his name as well. And that was effectively um, as the image kind of instantly kind of came out from the camera itself. And then you would effectively like you would, everybody's you know, used a Polaroid camera, they yeah. know kind of generally yeah. how they work, um, but it kind of produced the actual exposure in under a minute, you know, that whole process of effectively the dark room and the camera all yeah. in one unit. Yeah completely blew people's minds and was was yeah. you know it it became you know it was a quite expensive at the time but it was very very sought after um you know and used a lot for uh, for like fashion photo shoots and they still are you know i think a lot of people still use uh, like polaroids now just for doing yeah. like test headshots and things like that well, like modeling agencies i think there was a certain quality to polaroid that uh that is quite unique and they do produce lovely prints um Obviously, they're just one off, so you can't mm. reproduce them unless you copy them and reproduce them. But they yeah. do, there's something special about a Polaroid. Uh, but yeah, they are really expensive. I remember when I, when I was studying, I think in the, in the 80s and early 90s, large format Polaroid became very popular within fashion and commercial photography, but it was prohibitively expensive. Yeah. But people would do polaroid prints through an enlarger as well so it wasn't just like in camera you'd get you you had a special uh a, a, like a frame and holder for, for your polaroids that you put under your enlarger and then you'd expose them there so you could make yeah. prints from your from your negatives uh or was it from slides see that's when it gets a bit i always got a bit mixed <laughs> up about <laughs> when you're printing with polaroid or 
because there were different types of color processes that came in as well. Because obviously, um, initially, photography was all in black and white. Yeah. Uh, but color photography was, it's surprising how early people were actually already experimenting with color imagery back, at, you know, when I think when Fox Talbot was, you know, producing his first images, people were already, they, they had the, the, the knowledge that you could do it because I knew about optics and color separations and things like that and that images could be produced by additive and subtractive color and stuff like that so then eventually that led into newer sort of uh, materials because uh, you had to have uh, filters color filters to separate out the color when you were taking a photo uh, yeah. and then you had to put it back together afterwards and there were various different ways of doing that and I think um, one of the first, it was autochromes, wasn't it? That were the first ones to come out. So I made a few notes about the development of color photography as well, because I thought, you know, alongside uh, the black and white, it's quite important. So mm. yeah, the first demonstration of color photography was actually in the 1860s, believe it or not. Gosh, that's only really, we're talking about 20 years yeah, or so after exactly. Daguerreotype was actually coming out with yeah. a camera. People were already wanting to to change and, you know, and update things. So it keeps going back to what we've been saying about how yeah. technology constantly yeah. in those yeah. early days is, is just so fervent and, and yeah. everybody's wanting to try and have a go. Yeah. But it was that, was that a process that became sustainable or, it or was, inexpensive? No, it wasn't. It was, um, it wasn't even really to demonstrate. It wasn't to do with photography. They were actually, mm -hmm. I think it was a lecture just to do with vision and eyesight and stuff like that. And how, how the eye works, they were trying to, figure out how how we see and what how we see in color so mm. it was part of a demonstration for that but then it later so it got kind of forgotten about and then picked up again in the 1890s when the first sort of color actual transparencies were produced in different ways so there was apparently once again i knew about autochromes um which came out in very early 20th century uh but previous to that there was uh another process or a couple of other processes. There apparently there was one by Professor John Jolie in Dublin who could produce uh, additive screen plate process, it's called. Uh, so they, they were basically color slides uh, that you had to view through light so you couldn't mm. have color prints. Yeah. And somebody else called Frederick Eugene Ives also had his own chromoscope the color photography system which became commercially available in this country in the 1890s so they were earlier but they they were just i think they were very expensive very complex didn't really catch on yeah and but they did produce some quite you know some very fine color images but it wasn't until the autochrome came out in 1907 mm -hmm. and that was uh the lumiere brothers who also obviously famously worked in film um they developed the autochrome process which was uh produced in in, in one image so you didn't need color separations yeah so that that was done and that then eventually led on to uh kodachrome agfa chrome and various other films that could create transparencies but yeah. that but they couldn't uh, they couldn't be made into prints or they were very complex they had to do color separations from those transparencies to make prints and then the first actually commercially available pr color printing process was called the vivex color process have you heard of that one not heard of that before no well i i, I got interested in that a long time ago because I'd seen some photos in an exhibition by a photographer called Madame Yvonne, who was a society photographer. And I saw some of the prints and they were these color prints from the 1920s and 30s. And I was a bit, I was quite amazed by the quality of them. I thought they were yeah. absolutely beautiful. They are mm. fantastic to look at. Um, but it, uh, once again, you had, to, you had one big camera that had three black and white plates in it to take the photos so you took three photos at the same time uh, there were three three lenses with different color filters so if a person moved it didn't matter because obviously you could photograph still lives in color at that point but you couldn't photograph people because yeah. if they moved in between the shots you couldn't then do the you couldn't merge the plates yeah so they developed this way of doing it with this huge camera um 
and it was very expensive again so it took a while to catch on and it wasn't until later then that they, they came up with the color negative films that then became uh the, the what was it c c4 which c41 is? c42 or something c42 <laughs> maybe is yeah yeah process. I, think I think it's c42 yeah. which made color negatives that could then be printed onto color film because up until then you could only do it by color separations and you had to sort of uh, transfer three layers of color film together which yeah. is how that how they made the original color movies as well i think it was a really complex process so yeah, yeah. i imagine that i say it must have added so much time and, and labor and obviously yeah. with that becomes yeah. expense as much as what we've yeah. talked about previously about speeding up the process of, yeah. of kind of capturing images, et cetera, made it yeah. more commercially viable in yeah. black and white that was, but color was still not only lagging behind, but people were still working in the background on that process to effectively shorten the period of, of how long it would take and make it easier and, and effectively allow people to, to do it at home if they were making a, a dark yeah. room or, or something like that. But ultimately, I suppose maybe then what, a hundred years or so on, when the birth of digital came out and everything was done in camera for you, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th that was the next big leap onwards, obviously. Um, and it's kind of, it's changed the face of photography really, isn't it? Cause it's oh, taken incredible, made it so easy to, to capture an image. Um, and like I say, capture an image. Now you say that you tend to say that now instead of take a photo. And um, that's why I'm kind of almost, you know, sometimes in some ways, I think it's a very different, different thing to photography. Photography for me, when I started, it was a, it was all about um, light kind of transforming something into something else. So mm. it was the action of light on a piece of paper, on a piece of film and the chemicals and everything involved that created the image. So it was a very, you were very aware of the process and you had to know a fair amount about it. I mean, you didn't have to because obviously you could just take take your take your photos and send them off to be processed. But yeah. when you studied photography, you then had to get into all the chemistry and, and all the rest oh, yeah. of it, which was a bit of a struggle. Oh well that's it now. <laughs> if, if if people haven't lived through that yeah, that kind of generation yeah. of, you know, struggling in dark rooms with 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 fixes and 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 all as you say, all the chemicals, etc. Yeah, yeah. Then what you've got in front of yourselves now with digital cameras and and editing equipment, it's it's a luxury really now. Because yeah. um, the one thing we actually remarked on before we started recording, with uh, when we were kind of comparing notes, is when the first digital photograph was taken. Um, that yeah. uh, we both thought it would have been a lot later than it was, yeah. but yeah, yeah. we had the the first known digitally recorded image was created in a Kodak lab. Um, it took about 23 seconds to capture and it had a resolution of 0 0.01 megapixels. And uh, in what year did you have that down as being uh, well, recorded? I've got down that the first digital image uh, to be published or produced uh, was in 1957. Oh wow! All right. Well, maybe this was um, yeah. maybe this was a slightly different process or a slightly different record. But I had this Kodak image was 1975, so it's maybe good, like okay. 20 years between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got 1957. It was the first um, black and white image uh, ah, produced right. by a guy called Russell Kirsch. It was a picture of his son, oh. uh, and it was shortly after it, because apparently the first digital signal was saved to magnetic tape uh that the that that first happened in 1951 so again progress was very rapid so if you yeah. imagine sort of capturing digital sig signals on to a ma magnetic tape moving on to actually getting an image out of that was quite a you know quite a rapid process yeah and then the first color digital images apparently were produced in 1972 Right. Okay. Um, so that may have been roughly where my, yeah. my notes were from, but. And then the first commercially available digital camera, which was the one with a wonderful name of the Cro Chroma, Cro I can't say it. <laughs> Chromemco, the Chromemco Cyclops. Cyclops. Chromemco Cyclops. <laughs> it sounds like a, more like a superhero to, villain. Yeah, <laughs> you had to use it with, with a microcomputer and apparently it was featured on the, 
1975 issue of Popular Electronics magazine. So it was really just for for nerds by the yeah. sounds of it. It so was it one of those things. Yeah, it was a yeah. technology thing. No one knew where it went because I yeah I I had notes maybe kind of a couple of years later. I mean like the first yeah. digital systems <clears throat> were coming in around 1975, yeah, yeah, yeah. but maybe another ten years later disposable yeah. cameras and DSLRs start to make their way in mid eighties. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, disposable cameras. I remember that was probably my first introduction to photography being born in, uh, in the eighties that, yeah. yeah, you used to see these disposable cameras used all the time, send them off to the shops to super snaps or Max Spielman. I think they're still around and yeah, yeah you basically get a process and you, you would get another camera back. Um, and basically had like another 36 exposures or so as well. Yeah. And that was the yeah, excitement yeah. is that, you, you know, as a child, you were given something that was fairly inexpensive. You could knock it around a little bit and, you know, it wouldn't really damage it too much, but there was excitement of, of what was going to come out the back end of it. No oh, one yeah, had sure. yeah, a yeah. preview as to what a photograph would look like before it was taken until DSLRs were coming in. Um, yeah, sure. So those, those disposable ones, they, they were still film cameras, weren't they? But, yes, but, yeah. yeah. Because I had a, the first camera I ever had was kind of similar in some ways. It was the um, Kodak Instamatic, yeah, uh, which just had a cartridge. So the film was in a cartridge, so you didn't need to load it in the dark or anything. You just stuck your cartridge in the back, shot it off. But it wasn't 35 mil. It was a sm smaller format. So yeah, it right. was, yeah, it was actually a much smaller format film in these cartridges. Took the cartridge out, send it off to, to get processed, and you get and they were little square prints that you used to get back. They were square rather than the sort of format that we used to with 35 mil cameras. Yeah. Uh, and you could get them in, you could get Kodachrome or black and white as well. So you'd either get a little set of black and white prints back or, or you'd get a set of, again, square format slides back. And that was in the, uh, I mean, I guess they, you know, that, that would have been in the mid 60s, I guess, because I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Again, you know, they, they moved on from uh, there even, you know, not that long after. We were talking, yeah. what, like mid-80s for, yeah. for the invention of the, the the DSLR as we we kind of see it now, in a sense. It's still changed, obviously. But then yeah. um, kind of early 90s was like the compact camera. Um, so yeah. cameras had tried to get smaller and smaller and yeah, smaller. Yeah, yeah. And then we it went a little bit bigger with the DSLR and there are those digital systems that tried to be and reduce them in sizes. So the, the, the kind of digital point and shoot, as we'd say, was like the compact camera that was yeah. kind of coming in early nineties. And that was so commercially viable. There were so many companies that were kind of churning out these, these kind of types of cameras. Everybody was after them, yeah. you know, I'm sure every household or you know every household that could afford one had a digital camera um as soon as it came out and i remember my mom and dad had one and the size of it was huge it's probably about the size of like a big chunky you know full frame dslr these days right. um but still you know people continue to kind of make them smaller and smaller and smaller um but yeah i think it was around about kind of 19 the early 90s 1991 something like that about the, the digital point and shoot became a thing was it that early I don't, yeah, you, I don't remember them being around then, not in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I was at college then, and we, there was, uh. I mean, in terms of the actual, um, let's say, photographic quality of the images, yeah. you know, I, I mean, we can look back and laugh now, you know, that we, yeah. we're probably literally talking about two, maybe three megapixels. So yeah, yeah. it wasn't necessarily something maybe kind of, looking back at them to sing and dance about, yeah, yeah. but the invention of it, the, you know, the, yeah. obviously it would come, become more commercially viable as years went by as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I'd certainly, you know, I've, I've done a few research on notes um, and kind of the, the dates somewhat fairly consistent. Obviously it'll vary like country to country, et cetera. And you know, how it oh, influences different so, markets. So bogged down in, in film and chemistry at that point that I didn't even know. But, but no, I mean, I think you're fairly I was right. Still using, I was using a Mamiya 6, 7 when I was working uh, in the early 2000s because mm. that, that still seemed to be the acceptable standard for, for most jobs is that what they'd expect it on, on yeah. medium format film. And I was using that uh, and it wasn't, and I remember the first kind of 
digital cameras that people started using professionally and thinking, no, I don't want to spend money on something like that because they're really expensive <laughs> and the quality is just so poor compared to what you get with well, film. Well, that's it. That was the irony. This is where film still yeah. outweighed digital in oh, terms for a long of quality. Time. Well, not yeah. for a long time, but for, for a good few years because I was still working on film and then, but it was it was ironic, really, because you were working on film, but then you had to get your film scanned because then it would go to some, and then they'd work on it in Photoshop digitally. Yeah. But the digital imaging, if you wanted digital imaging equipment yourself, it would cost an absolute fortune. You could get That's a digital it. back to put on the Mamiya camera. Yeah. But the outlay was thousands of pounds, and it was like, you know, I can't afford to spend thousands of pounds on it. Well, that, that's what that's where camera. my kind of introduction to um digital cameras first well I say first came in kind of yeah. i was aware of um that i remember my mom and dad just having like a, a digital camera kind of around the house taking family pictures you know yeah. and that's kind of like more maybe more like later 90s yeah. um yeah. i would i would pick it up and use it etc but yeah. yeah my my first personal camera was a nikon f55 um so that would have been kind of maybe like 1998 99 so that was still 35 mil yeah. um and then i went to university a couple of years later and studying photography everybody had a film camera you know yeah. technology was talked about with with digital cameras but it hadn't been widely accepted in the education sector that this was going to be maybe the next direction people were maybe a little bit skeptical to its its impact and its quality um obviously you could say in hindsight that was all silly but you know you just don't know at those times you don't want to make these big changes um so everybody was still shooting um yeah. on 35 yeah. mil so you know they'd learned darkroom techniques but then there were a number of people like you were saying who were then getting those images um those prints and those dig um, those negatives converted digitally mm. to then take into editing because they still had a better quality finish than the current like dslrs yeah. and, and point and shoots and i mean obviously digital caught up quickly didn't it yeah yeah i mean the f the first digital images that that i ever took i suppose would would have been through through my uh smartphone through blackberry yeah oh, wow <laughs> before i actually got a, ca a digital camera <laughs> Because I think that's, you know, I think um, smartphones really sort of spurred on the uh, development of, of digital imaging because more and more people started using smartphones, didn't they? And yeah. were, got used to being able to take pictures and share them and stuff like that. Um, and then later on, I think uh, I, I, it was one of the earlier sort of cam Canon DSLRs, which was okay, but still quite pixelated when you enlarged them. Uh, and then I've kind of upgraded to, I can't remember which one it is now, but it's another, it's a, a more recent Canon. But even that one now uh, is probably, I mean, I bought that about 10 years ago. And I don't really see the need to upgrade it because it, it you know, it, it's good enough for my purposes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 the improvement in quality was so rapid in terms of the amount of um, pixels you got in your image, which is obviously the main thing. Mm. So you went from images that if you enlarge them on the screen quite rapidly, you'd see lots of little square sort of pixels in it <laughs> to ones where you could see lots of really fine detail now. And, uh, but I, I mean, I've got some old images that I actually took on the Blackberry, which I quite like because they're so heavily pixelated. It gives it this almost um, like sort of pointillist kind of impressionist <laughs> to the images when you, when you look at them on screen. Um, but one of the things I think about these days is that we don't, um, I think we talked about this in our fine art um, uh, podcast, didn't we? That, that, that you're so used to seeing images on screen now, you view them on screen, you don't see them as prints very often. That's Whereas it. in the past, it was all about the print. And I, I, I even made um, color prints uh, at one point using, uh, now what process was that? Cibachrome, which mm. again is another process that's disappeared now with Cibachromes. Yeah. Um, you, could t you could print it directly from a transparency. And they were much brighter, more sort of, uh, I don't know, there was, something, there was a quality to those images that was really nice. And you could actually do that at home reasonably easily. You had to have, it was like a big tube. So, you know, the, 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 how you used to load uh, film 
into the little developing cans. Yeah. So it was like a giant version of a developing can. Oh, wow. You put you put your piece of paper, you exposed it first, obviously, but you had to do it in complete darkness, I think, rather than using a, a, a using a safe light. Yeah. And then you loaded it into this drum. And then the drum went on a little uh, machine with rollers that rolled it. So it rolled and you filled it with chemistry and the chemistry sort of washed over it. Yeah. But it had to be done at a certain temperature. So although it, you know, it was a bit tricky, but you could do it at home and you could produce really good quality color prints yourself briefly, you know, for a few years. That, that was a possibility. Um, but again, you know, very quickly disappeared because uh it just wasn't viable anymore and people were moving on to other things well, there were so it. many different ways of printing <clears throat> like if you think over the i think the heyday of different printing methods was really the early 19th century and probably look at some of that um in one of the other podcasts with all the different types of prints that you can make uh, people experimented with all sorts of different materials and ways of printing and came up with some beautiful images which um they're all still available it's all stuff that you can still do yourself if you're prepared to go to the lengths of buying the yeah. chemistry and the paper coating the papers yourself and doing it some of them are quite simple processes mm. some of them much more complex some of them you can't do because they're required you know factory made sort of yeah and things specific like that. chemicals Some specific chemicals which uh, is a bit of a shame because in in some ways You've got so much more you can do, you think, through Photoshop and Lightroom. You've got all this there sort of at your fingertips. But at the same time, you've got less choice in terms of what you get at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of the types of prints and the different processes. And although each process was limited in itself, it was very unique. So the, 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 I think it was easier in some ways to produce very unique photos because you develop your own way of doing it. Well, that's it. That was uh, the necessity because whereas now you've got presets. So uh, you it, could end that's the, that's the problem. You could, yeah. it's great for consistency. You know, if you're yeah. trying to as maybe as a business deliver a, a certain sure. look, but yeah, yeah. the artistic process, I think didn't stop with the camera. It also uh, extended itself to the dark yeah. room that yeah, yeah. you did have to be skilled. You know, you, you couldn't yeah. kind of, you know, you could be lucky in some instances, but you know, you won't be lucky every time. Whereas nowadays, you know, with the exposure simulation, everything you see on the back of your camera, you know what you're going to get, you know, before you press the button, you can decide to do it or not. Whereas you had to be skilled to kind of get the image to, you know, its final point yeah. and make it still look good yeah. because there's so many variables that could go wrong. Um, as you say, with chemistry, all you've got to do is, is mix a few different chemicals or washes or fixes incorrectly. Yeah. Um, and it would ruin like your highlights yeah. or your, yeah, yeah. your shadows as well. But yeah. I, I think on, on the flip side of that, I could understand why digital technology became, you know, the primary use uh, in photography because the rest of the world was going that way, not even just photography, but, you know, we're talking yeah. early 2000s as we're well, up to at the minute. And that, that's like when the internet's kicking in, isn't it? That, and yeah, that, course, that's when yeah. everything, you know, you're yeah. seeing images online, so you need some sort of medium to be able to capture images, yeah. get it up onto a, onto a digital space quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and this is where obviously, you know, digital took over the world. But yeah. do you still have film cameras? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've still got all my cameras, the ones, well, the ones that didn't get stolen or lost yeah. or broken <laughs> or whatever. I think even back to the somewhere, I, I I'm sure I've still got that old Instamatic, although it's obviously not usable anymore because you can't get the film cartridges to put in it. Um, I think I've got my first um, SLR, which I think was an old Pentax. I've got a, a, a really nice, um, it's the Pentax um, medium format camera, which I used to really like using because it was um, different to other medium formats in that it looks like just looks like a big SLR. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's got a prism. So you, you hold it up. It's, it's a bit oh, unwieldy because it's big to hold. Yeah. But it's just like a giant version of uh, normal sort of SLR camera. So um, you don't need to. I mean, it's very basic, obviously, but I, I used to like using that because it was, you know, eye level rather than, you know, held down. And apparently quite a lot of photographers uh favor that still uh, yeah. in terms of taking uh particularly for black and white i think it's been very popular mm. with uh photographers that work in black and white medium format 
Yeah. Yeah, the same supply level rather than using a waste level. The waste level. There. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> but uh, I mean, the thing is, you know, when people, um, a lot of people say, "Oh, Photoshop is so complicated," you know, <laughs> it'll take me forever to do this and do that, and you kind of think, "Yeah, well, you know, try <laughs> try working the way we used to." <laughs> well, work. exactly. Yeah. Darkroom, is... enlargers, all the <laughs> equipment you needed. The, the, oh, there was so much equipment you needed. Yeah. So much you had to learn all the different process particularly if you wanted to you know control the whole process yourself wasn't so bad if you just took photos and sent film off to get the prints done and back home so uh you know for for you know for for doing a family album and stuff like that was fine yeah if you were more interested in being creative and doing the kind of things that a lot of people are doing here on on eye photography uh it would have been so, it, you know, so complicated. There's so much to learn. You had to really sort of understand yeah. a lot about, um, you know, the physics and the chemistry of it as well. Yeah. A lot of which, you know, I, you know, it's so long ago now that I can't really remember half of it. But <laughs> I remember at the time thinking, oh, you know, this See, the is one, really complicated. The one thing that always kind of catches my attention, and this is maybe yeah. the, the, the glamorization somewhat of photography, but if you ever yeah. watch... A photographer uh, um, in a movie. Um, a, it's never digital. You know, it's it's always film. I don't know why, <laughs> but they always like have like a basement or a, a separate room, and they yeah. have all this stuff in because that yeah. was it. You know, at that time, um, you needed so much equipment, like you said, yeah. but so much space. And you know, yeah. this is why it, it's great if you've got houses with you know attic conversions or basement conversions. Um, I, I won't get onto the fact that you know, pretty much in nearly every film Hollywood's ever made that includes a photographer. It makes a photographer out to be some sort of sinister serial killer. I, well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what's about us as a, as a hobby, you know, types of hobbyists that were always portrayed as some sort of voyeuristic murderer. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, I guess it's that voyeuristic element, isn't it? I think it possibly pointing is. A, pointing a lens at somebody and sort of sneakily taking a photo. That's it. It's but like... they always needed tons of room and a big space yeah. to have all the equipment. And now, if you think, you know, I literally have got my phone in front of me, I could pick that up, take a picture, edit it, mm. you know. No, I'm not saying necessarily it'd be exactly the same as like a, a film shot, but it, the process we go through, um, it's yeah. literally in one tiny unit now that yeah. can go everywhere with me. And, yeah, you know, we, we've talked over a period of really, if we're looking from like the daguerreotypes as being like the, the, the earliest incantation yeah. of a camera. So what we're talking about, 100 and uh 60, 180 years, we've yeah. gone from what he conceived as photography to now everything is, is in, you know, your, your yeah. phone. So <laughs> thinking of what, technology is going to be like even in 10 20 years what how do you foresee this going what, what what's the it's, what's the future it's so Nick? <laughs> hard because you kind of think how can you get any further than that you know yeah. how can you go any further on than you know other than making it smaller but if you make it yeah. smaller, then you can't see it, can you? So, so well, that's it. It's, it. it's the irony that I think phones have got to a point where they, yeah. they got really small and then yeah. they've gone a bit bigger again. You know, uh, on what point will they go backwards? Or... <laughs> or, well, I, t I suppose there's this idea you could have a camera, you know, implanted in your in your eye. Ah, now this is, yes, where my mind goes. Here we have, go. you, have you seen Black Mirrors? Ooh. Is on Netflix. Oh yes, of course I have. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there is an episode for anybody that's listening or watching this not before. Um, basically, yeah, they get like a, a chip implanted behind their ear, and it records everything that they see, yeah. they hear. So literally, like CCTV of your own eyes, and it's recorded. I mean, the, the whole story that's connected to it is really, really yeah. good. So check it out yeah. if you, you've not yeah, seen yeah. it. But I think that could. I, I don't. I see kind of an Elon Musk type person. <sighs> Yeah. going into mm. and kind of you know changing humans into technology in such yeah. a way and i don't think that's um i think i don't think it's too far-fetched that that no, won't potentially either. have occurred in 20 30 years really but do you think you if if that ever existed would you let them put that in your head oh i don't know it just seems a bit scary but then... doesn't it at the same time, I kind of think, you know, did, should I have been dipping my hands in all these chemicals <laughs> in the what? past? What have I breathed in over the years? Uh, what do you mean? How you, has you, that you, affected my your brain? Six, you your six-fingered hand. <laughs> Is that an issue now? Ugh, but, but yeah, you know. I mean, it's it's interesting. So, you know, if, you, if you're watching and you're listening, um, 
it would be really, really good to kind of get your insights as to uh, not only to kind of talk about what we've talked about um, with the, the history of photography, but where you see it going really as well. You know, if you've got kind of inventions of things that you think would turn up in photography, what it would look like in another 20 years or so, because we've we've covered so much in, you know, uh, the, the, this show that we've gone back kind of 200 years, even actually further when we were talking about the uh, yeah, uh, the camera obscura as well. We, we've covered so much. So I think we'll, we'll hold our conversation there because we've got three parts yeah. of this. This is, this is step yeah. one out of three. And if you've enjoyed it, then we're going to go into episode two of this mini series. And we're talking, like Nick said at the start, about movements of photography and then particular photographers. So catch us for a future show on that basis. Um, and then we will talk about, as you say, kind of lots of different variations of, of, of movements of photography. I mean, what, 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 without getting into it in too much depth, kind of what's your favorite movement within photography? Oh God, that's a difficult one. I think I've always been very much because I'm, I like fine art photography and the, you know, the personal aspects of photography. So I guess a lot of the, early photography of the early 19th century yeah where they were using they were getting much more creative uh in their imagery and their printing and stuff like that uh i think that's probably my favorite era i think it was because it was so experimental and there's so much going on as well yeah uh from say about 1900 through to you know the 19 1920s i guess is my favorite period as such um yeah it, it it was just there was so much going on and so much interesting stuff being made then but i also like a lot of um i, I, I like fashion photography i'm I, you know i'm not a fashion photographer mm. uh and i know a lot of people see it as being very superficial but um i just like the creativity in fashion photography just on, yeah. on, on that basis i think visually you see some amazing images in fashion uh, and I always think it's a, a little bit undervalued as, you know, because a lot of people take, say, documentary photography much more seriously as, as a, you know, as the true, you know, what's true photography, you know, documentary landscape, things like that seem to be placed on a higher level. Yeah. Whereas, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've always been quite very interested in, in, in fashion photography in the in that it's very experimental and you know it's quite 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 out there sometimes as well which i like oh yeah i think that that the, the outrageous aspects needs yeah. to i think it's that balance because like you said again without getting into this too heavily because this is going to be in the next show that yeah your landscapes your your war photography because that's a very very big thing you know kind of yeah. obviously going back kind of 50 yeah. 60 years documentary photography that was a very serious art that yeah. was the professionalism that was the, yeah. the you know the, the the kind of for for the elite so to speak yeah. whereas there still needed to be fun there needed to be balance yeah. and kind of yeah. chaos of what photography could still be you know as a, as a creative medium and i think as you said fashion uh really really kind of uh worked on that kind of quite heavily and produced some um, phenomenal yeah. shots through you know uh, some amazing amazing changes in society. So we're not going to kind of go too much in depth about that now because we're going to kind of cap our uh, talk about the history of uh, camera technology there and you're going to have to wait for the next show. So if you like potentially what's going to be coming up uh, and we're going to be going through lots of different variations about uh, kind of societal photography and movements of photography in our next podcast as well. But hopefully you've enjoyed the show today. Um, and if you have, if you've been listening to us on Apple Podcasts, if you don't mind leaving us a little review and a rating, it's one place that now um, you can't really review and rate podcasts on many different platforms. I don't think Spotify has that ability just yet but I know it's on Apple Podcasts. So if you have been listening for a while, if you've been subscribing and following to the podcast, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. But if you wouldn't mind dropping us a review on Apple, uh, we'd love you even more and more and more. Um, and in the meantime, Nick, I'm going to say thank you very much to you and your wonderful encyclopedia knowledge of photography. <laughs> right. And it will continue again into our next episode. So if you've enjoyed this, kind of catch the show um, next week and we're bringing you another story another kind of show about the history of photography so thank yeah. you very much 
yeah thanks for listening um i hope you found it interesting uh i find it it if it, it's i find it endlessly fascinating but then mm. i'm I, i'm like that with history anyway and uh, you know it's kind of a rabbit hole if you want to dive into it there's so much to so much to find out so much to learn and yeah. i think it's valuable to get into it because I, I you know i think you can you can find a lot in the history of photography to sort of spur you on in your own photography even though it might not mm. seem particularly relevant in terms of you know the process and the chemistry and all the other things that are going on but you'll you'll see stuff and you'll come across stuff that i think could uh, you know could be really valuable in your own uh, development as a photographer visually yeah very true lovely well thank you so much again for joining us and catch us on the next show if you want to know any more about eye photography there'll be a link in the description attached to this podcast show uh, and you can find out more anyway but in the meantime thank you very very much for listening and we'll catch you soon bye-bye now <laughs>